to welcome Front. you all to the Brown County Historical Society Dakota War Week presentation today. Our guest speaker is Terry Sweeney. Terry is a graduate of Mankato State University with a degree in history and geography. He worked in areas of travel and tourism for over 30 years, and more recently he has become mayor of the law. This topic is, what happened to the animals? Re-examining New Orleans during the U.S. Dakota War. And that is an interesting question. Using tax records, narratives, depredation claims, and newspaper accounts, Terry has pieced together information that sheds light on this question. Please welcome Terry Sweeney. <laughs> All right, <laughs> glasses, brow mopper, we got to be all prepared here. Can everybody hear in the back? Good. I kind of talk loud to begin with. And did you see my bald head in the front page of the journal today? <laughs> Sitting over there, I got the back of my head. Every time I see my head from a different angle, instead of in the mirror, it looks like there's hair, but uh, from the back, there's not much hair anymore. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I'm Terry Sweeney, as you know. Thank you, Darla. And so I got to thank people to start off with. I'll thank the Brown County Historic Society for giving me the chance to do this. Darla, who just spoke to you, is the research librarian at the museum, and she helped me find records that I would never even knew existed, as well as most of the photos you see that are not generic internet found pictures are from the Brown County Historic Society. If I'm right, there's only two pictures in existence that were taken current with the Sioux Uprising. Uh, one is the family fleeing across the prairie and then at Camp Release. Is, I think those are the only two current with the Uprising. So any of the pictures you see are not taken from 1862 that I'm going to be showing you. Uh, I also interviewed Bill Baumgartner. Bill, are you here? Nope. And Jim Jensen, who is here in front in the blue shirt. I interviewed them about some of the traits of the animals we'll be talking about, and they were super insightful. So whenever I do a talk, I always start out saying, what prompted this work? Why are we here? Why am I talking about this? And it started with a newspaper article when I was doing family history, with a newspaper article, from, a Minneapolis newspaper from 1925. And they were interviewing um, settlers who had lived through the uprising, who were kind of there for the 63rd anniversary of the event, a, a weird round, not round number, but a lady named Mrs. Anna Schmitz Thule, and my mother's maiden name is Schmitz, hence my connection, and she was 74 years old at the time, and she talked about, she, her father was killed by an Indian in 1860, and so she and three siblings and her mother moved in with my great-great-grandpa and his brother. They farmed well, between Essig and Sleepy Eye, about eight, ten miles west of here. And she said, they were eating lunch. We were at dinner, and the cabin door was open. I heard a scream and looked out and saw a neighbor boy running toward the house. His right arm was limp, and he was covered with blood. And what he basically said is, the Indians are going crazy on the prairie. You've got to get out of here. And as we've heard in many studies, people didn't believe him. And my great-great-grandpa and the family did not believe him because they had just seen some Indian people and had no inkling there was unrest. And they look out and, oh, son of a gun, my neighbor's barn is and farm is on fire. There's some Indian men off a few blocks from there. So they loaded up two oxen into their wagon and fled into New Ulm. And she's keen to say, uh, I don't know, I didn't highlight it here, but she said, we can't really say we fled because an ox walks two miles an hour and a person walks three miles an hour. <laughs> but, but to haul everybody in their wagon, they fled into New Ulm. And so I always thought, where did my great-great-grandpa Peter Schmitz keep his animals? I presume they were expensive. Peter Schmitz is the, the older man in the middle with his wife Gertrude, my great-great-grandma, and their children. But Peter was single during the time of the fighting. Uh, and so where did great-great-grandpa keep his animals? I presume they were expensive, and the only place you could have kept them, in my opinion, was downtown within the barricades. As you know, the town was barricaded from Center Street to 3rd North along Minnesota Street, and then to the alleyway on either side. So what I call a three-block three island of defense. 
So I've written about 80 pages on this work. I don't have a booklet for sale. I should have been more entrepreneurial than that, I guess. Uh, and I go into many examples and many uh, ways of presenting the material, but due to our time, I, I'm going to keep it to what I present here. When you do research, whether it's historical related or not, don't you find you're here and you want to find the answer to that? And you think it's going to be a straight line to that answer. More often than not, you say, oh, what's this? And you go on over here, and you explore that, and then you come back, and then, oh, now you're over here. And that's what I found with this. Nobody has written about this topic that I'm aware of, and Darla's agreeing with me in the back, and if anyone would know, she would be the one. And I can see why. I've never done more research to find such little results as this. <laughs> but I've pegged together this, 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 and this, and I think I've come up with something that's going to going to be of interest. It may, based on questions people have asked me the last two weeks, this may not be what you think it's going to be. But bear with me because it's going to be what it's going to be. So <laughs> there's two things that I had not encountered before, which was the tax records. They have them down at the Historic Society. Perhaps they have them at the courthouse, but we use the ones at the Historic Society. I looked at 1860, 61, and 62, and it told me that there were tons of animals in New Ulm I didn't know about. And then a second source I use is the depredation or dep claims, they're sometimes called. And those, I'll explain those to you. When the Indians were forced to sell their land at the two treaties in 1851, they were promised yearly money, annuities it was called, uh, to be paid for 50 years. And after the war ended and the, in, the Dakota people were banished from the state of Minnesota, the federal government said, we'll take that money and we'll pay people who lost things, who lost property during the, during the fighting. And so what you had to do, though, is fill out a list of everything you owned or, and that you lost. Now, we have so much crap in our house these days that you could never do that. But I've seen lots of these, and it's super detailed, and you have to assign a money value to everything. I got shirts that my wife stores incorrectly and they seem to have shrunk. Um, <laughs> but I still got them in the house. I couldn't tell you what they cost. So, but those are, they're fascinating. I've read my great, great grandpa Peter Schmitz's and just amazing to me what, what they had, the little that they had, frankly. So, but in there was also some, some animal losses. So we've got, there's about nine, I'm, this number isn't accurate, but it'll be in the ballpark for you. There's about 900 depredation claims and we have maybe 400 or so, 300. I'm looking for confirmation, Darla. <laughs> 3,000 claims, so there's way more than I thought. But So I, I'm not going to tell you I read all of them. For one thing, we don't have all of them, but we're, we're getting them every year we get more. But I read enough to have some, some good, solid information. So let's look ahead. There's those two oxen. Oxen were different animals than people seem to think of them. If you've ever gone to the Jeffers petroglyphs, and I was just there two weekends ago, they've got a big taproot from prairie grasses, and they're like six to eight feet deep. And then you put all of that right next to each other. It said that a horse couldn't cut through that virgin land. You needed the power of an ox to cut through. So great-great-grandpa's oxen were his livelihood. He was a farmer, and if he didn't have his oxen, he was not a farmer anymore. The ox was equivalent to his tractor, his combine, his trucks. It was everything. So my supposition that they were important is, is accurate, but I, we needed more details. So this is Mike Eichen's wonderful 2004 painting of the Second Battle of New Ulm. It's, in my mind, the best visual we have of what the town looked like. Uh, if you haven't seen it, there's a, there's a frame, a metal frame in the front yard of the museum. With that in full scale, I've kind of narrowed into the center of town. And then the actual painting is within the, on the third floor at the exhibit. But I think that's wonderful. And I'm not faulting Mike. I think he did a great job. But what's missing from there is the animals. And I'll, show, I'll tell you in a minute. Look at, uh, so this is, oh, it's not on here. Old Turner Hall would be sitting just about here. So you're sitting there. And that's Minnesota Street. You'll notice the barricades. So like here, down to 3rd North, and then back. And there was, that was the town. That was during the fighting. So kind of keep that in your mind. So I started with the tax records, and I found categories. They listed categories of animals. And I didn't expect to find much, but I found a lot. Um, there was tons of animals in New Orleans. Where am I pointing to here? There we go. So in my findings, 
New Orleans population per the census of 1860, 635, I can't read that, uh, estimated though many sources say during the fighting we had 900 citizens in New Orleans. And the numbers of families, what, uh, 176? An families with animals, virtually all of them, 141. Number of horses, only 35, we'll talk about that later, but 35 horses uh, by, owned by the citizens of New Orleans. Cattle, and I'm thinking that they were milk cows or milk koo to the Germans, rather than oxen. You didn't need oxen for your little farms you had in your town, but, but uh, you would want milk cows. So 300 some. Number of hogs, 127. One guy had one sheep. <laughs> diversity, right? <laughs> Animal diversity. <laughs> number of carriages, 31. And then what's not mentioned in the tax reports is the numbers of birds. There were hundreds and probably thousands of birds here. Mainly chickens, ducks, and geese, but some people kept pigeons. And, and no mention of pets either. And so we will talk briefly about pets here, but uh, I'm sure people had cats and dogs as well. So lots of animals. So if you've got that many animals, and virtually everybody has animals, what else do you have to have? Well, a New Ulm lot, is this, the, the, it was laid out just like it is now, um, is 50 feet wide, that is across the front of the street, and it's 165 feet deep. Roughly, if you don't know, if you're not from town and don't know what a New Ulm lot looks like, look at this empty space behind the building here to the corner, that's roughly a lot. And so they would, it would have been full of things. They would have had barns for their horses and, and cattle. They would have had pig styes and chicken coops. They would have had a large um, garden, would have had outhouses, water, water pumps. You would have had manure piles and you would have had haystacks or other food sources. Some of the depredation claims talk about people losing an eight ton stack of hay. I, I asked Randy Melzer, who's a guy, hangs out at Turner Hall, yeah, although he's much more than that. <laughs> uh, and he, he said, he kind of showed me in the other room what, what it would be about the size of this here, but twice as high. So it's a lot. So every lot was full of stuff. There's a man in town named Adam Tosto. He has a snow removing and lawn mowing service. Adam would be out of business in 1862. Nobody had any lawn to mow. Whatever grass there was was used for the animals to eat. So this town was really a collection, not as pristine as Mike shows it here, but would have been a collection of miniature farms. That's funny to think about, but that's exactly what it would have been. So with all of that animals, think what else you've got. You've got the sounds and the smells and the sights. You would have been hearing cows mooing and pigs squealing. Horses whinnying, birds cackling. I don't know what that one lone sheep would have been doing. <laughs> and kids crying. The smell of manure and earthiness would have been everywhere. Now if you walk somewhere and you smell earthiness, you kind of, ooh, that's bad. But it would have been everywhere. It wouldn't have been the exception as it is now. And I know I'm skipping ahead a bit in history. I looked at city hall minutes or city council minutes. In 1923, they passed a resolution which prohibited the public herding of cows on South, Pro South Park property. And then in 1935, so I know we're like 70 some years after the fact, but to show you the difference, they passed an ordinance that said stables, chicken or other poultry yards or houses, cow yards or lots, pig pens or styes, and other similar use of property which may be objectionable to adjacent property owners because of unsanitary conditions, odor, breeding of flies and vermin, or a general nuisance may be permitted in the residential di district only after the owner of the proposed property use had secured the written consent of 75% of all of the neighbors within a block and a half. <laughs> in other words, it ain't gonna happen. So what was everywhere in town virtually was by 75 years later was a big no-no. You couldn't do that. So it's a, that was a big finding to me. But that was one of those, I'm going from here to there, but I got sidetracked over here. But we'll come back to those animals. So let's set that aside for a while. Go back to my premise. I assume that great-great-grandpa's oxen were valuable, but I didn't know that. Don't you hate it when pseudo-historians tell you things like, oh, that was a lot of money back then. They just throw it out there like it's this thing and we all accept and go, yeah, I bet it was. We don't, we don't know that. And I like to think I'm a better historian than to tell you that was a lot of money, then I gotta tell you why. 
So I looked at newspaper ads, newspaper stories, depredation claims, auction notices, and tax records, and I found out that for a yoke of oxen, the term for two of them, costs between $150 and $200. A good horse, and I always said in quotations because there were not good horses, a good horse cost also between $150 and $200. So $200 seems like a lot of money. I could have told you that was a lot back then, but we got to do better than that. So what was comparable to $200 in 1862? You know, as the country moved steadily westward and we took over Indian lands, the federal government would always put it up for sale to kind of encourage white settlement. And the one nearest our time period here, the Homestead Act of May 20th, 1862, sold land in 160 acre parcels for a dollar and a quarter an acre. Do your math, it's $200. So Peter Schmitz's two oxen were the same value as his entire farm. So yeah, they were, they were precious animals. My guess was right in that case. So, but where is he gonna keep these? That was the second part of my guess. Where is he gonna keep all of these, these precious animals that himself and all the refugees that came in came with? So I'm not gonna tell you I know everything about the US Dakota War, or nor that I've read everything about it, but I've read an awful lot about it. I own many books about it, and I looked through all of them, and I looked and looked, and I could find no mention of animals or where they were kept during the fighting. And then Darla suggested, have you looked at the personal narratives? Well, no, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> and so those were stories written by people who lived through the fighting after the fact. Some are one page long, and some are 20 pages long, most about five, six pages. And we've got about 150 of them or so. They're divided into gender, so I thought I'll start with the females. And I read all of the ladies' accounts, and nobody talked about animals in there at all. I'm thinking, what kind of project are you taking on here, Sweeney? There's no information on this. <clears throat> then I started in with the men, and I got up to the M halfway through the alphabet, and I thought, son of a gun, there's still nothing in here. Until I came to Aaron Meyer. How many of you were here yesterday? It's the same Aaron Meyer that Corinne Mars talked about. And in Aaron Meyer's account, she read this exact same thing yesterday, but I just, I was smiling to myself back there. Aaron Meyer's account says, the people from the surrounding country moved into the business part of the town, down, downtown in other words. They got a whole lot of loose material and barricaded it the best they could, but the Indians still killed and wounded many. There was a common inside of the enclosure, and this was packed with horses, wagons, and oxen. Yay, my guess was right. And the people were in as much danger from them as they were from the Indians. They all stampeded and went up Main Street, in many cases taking wagons with them. We'll come back to that because I want to I debate that statement, but we'll come, we'll come to that in a moment. The dogs barked and partook of the pandemonium, the perfect word for it all, pandemonium, biting anything that came in reach. Men were detailed to shoot down all the dogs. That's my sole mention of dogs as pets, <laughs> that they got killed. Um, so, we're downtown, three block island of defense where the animals were stored. So how many animals were there, I figured. I had to know that. But to figure that out, I had to find out how many people were in the area. So the common statistics are that there, oh, let me get, I got ahead of myself here. This is a little, it's off the internet, so I'm not telling you it's from New Ulm. But to get the idea of these miniature farms, which really most of the residences were, Mrs. Radloff, feeding her chicken. She lived up on State Street, I believe. I don't know her address. That would have been a common sight. That's a real one from New Ulm, not of this time period, but the concept the same. Downtown, pulling wagons, oxen pulling wagons to, to market. That's a Mr. Meinrad Epley, who was a butcher, and this is his funeral. Just look at what that lot, the street looks like, crowded with wagons and animals in it. We're gonna come back to that concept, too. So, ooh, if I was on, on the radio, this would be dead air. You can't have that. <laughs> so I'm going to say that Mr. Myers thought that the animals ran freely downtown. Was probably, not, maybe it was true when he came to town, but I don't think it was that way all the time, and we'll talk about why. So let's get a numbers, numbers of people here. 
So I use four terms to define the people. These are my terms. Darla's never heard these. She's going, he, is that right? <laughs> so uh, the first thing to know, keep two numbers in mind, 900 New Orleans citizens, and by the time the evacuation on the 25th of August, said by many sources to be 2,000 people. That's, as they say, curiously round, so it probably wasn't exact. I don't think anybody sat there and was writing down a little census ad hoc here. And so, so but 900 New Almites, 2,000 people. That means that 1,100 people were not from New Alm. So who were those people? So I'm calling one group the Relief Defenders. These were people who came over to help defend New Alm from St. Peter, uh, Mankato, LeSueur, and parts of Nicollet County. They would have come as unaccompanied men. They were not coming with their families as refugees. They are to the east. It's safer there. And they came to defend New Ulm. And it's fair to say to also use New Ulm as a bulwark because if they broke through New Ulm, then they're coming to St. Peter and Mankato. So they're kind of protecting themselves by protecting New Ulm. Um, they would have been infantrymen, that is walking on feet. There's a few instances where some officers had horses, but very few. So. We'll get some numbers for you in a moment. Refugee defenders. This is a term I use to say these are men who came to New Ulm from surrounding farms and villages and were immediately enlisted as part of the militia to defend the town. Most of these would have been from points west of New Ulm. As we said, if you lived in Judson, you probably went to Mankato for refuge. And they would have come as refugees with a family. We don't know the makeup of their family. Some would have been single men, yes, but I think the majority would have been family people. They would have come with the help of a draft animal or two in a wagon. We know that some were single men who walked to town from Milford. We knew that some were, were rode on a single horse. But the majority are, are refugee guys coming with their family in a, in a wagon with some animals pulling it. They immediately are in the militia. The local defenders refer simply to the men living in New Ulm. They were all part of the militia, and their families would have come inside the barricades. Possibly a few brought some of their large animals into the barricades, the numbers we saw from the mini, the mini farms that existed in town. And the non-combatants refers to the non-militia people made up of women, children, and older or disabled men. Very few older men. This is a new town, and you know, I'm 66. I wouldn't have left wherever I was to start a new town. That's not what you do. I, I'm, it's not fun anymore to do that. We know the names of all the men. And people, well, how do we know that and not the ladies? Because the men were all part of the militia, and the militia is military, and the military keeps great records. There's the U.S. in the Civil... Uh, what? U.S. in the Civil and Indian Wars is like the definitive source. It's two volumes. It's about that high. This is a condensed version local historian Elroy Ubel put together, and he talks about everybody. Here's, here's all the men from the Milford Company. Here's all the guys from Lafayette and from Cottonwood. Here's the first guys that came over from Mankato and St. Peter. So all, we know the names of all the men here. That's kind of cool. Let's see if my chart comes up. There it is. Don't look at all of that. It's just that's me being too detailed. But look at the bottom little bit there. Summary, types of people in New Orleans. So relief defenders, 449 people coming from the towns east of us. Refugee defenders, the men who came as refugees, 235. Local defenders, that is the men in New Orleans, 155. Local non-combatants, meaning the, the lady, women and children from New Orleans. And then refugee non-combatants. 416, so that's 2,000. So my numbers, are, other than the men we know, are guesses based on the 900 projected people in, in town and the 2,000 when we evacuated. So those numbers, don't anybody write this down and say, Terry Sweeney said there, we're da 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 No, Terry did not say that. So, but that gives us a context from which we can now extrapolate some animal, animal numbers. So there was no animals. No record of any animals. As I said, I looked through, I won't tell you everything, but anything that mattered. All of the first-hand accounts of people written from New Ulm, all the books written by New Ulm people, and nobody talked about animals. Uh, so I had to figure out, how can I put some number on these animals to tell you what downtown looked like? And one measurement, we'll talk about three or four different types of measurement. One measurement says, and it's Charles Flandreau writes this number, as do many others. When the town was evacuated on August 25th, there were exactly 153 wagons. Um, I'm gonna, that's such a weird number that I'm going to believe it. And it's been repeated by many. So uh, 153 wagons. Well, at minimum, you had 153 animals to pull them. 
But I would suspect that you probably had situations like this, Anton Gog and his partners drawing the, in their panorama series of the war. You know, you see some of them there have two horses pulling, one in the background has four oxen pulling, and he's just getting us in the ballpark. So probably many of the wagons were pulled by more than one animal. I also think it's only logical, at least to me, that you're not gonna leave any animals behind after the fighting's done and the town is all but destroyed. You know, why would you leave a couple horse or oxen sitting there just deal with an animal? That doesn't make sense. They were valuable. We know that. We proved that. And so they were probably brought along too. Many of those animals were emaciated. They hadn't eaten properly. They hadn't surely had not drank enough during the whole time. And they were, they were probably very weak. They may not have even been able to pull anything. They probably just went with, followed the caravan to Mankato. And so then I did some other numbers. Well... This again, don't you dare say, Terry Sweeney said this is fact. No, Terry Sweeney's saying these numbers will get us in the ballpark. Another way to count animals might be from the refugee count. We counted 651 refugees. Remember, refugee defenders and the non-combatants. So 651 uh, people came from outside of New Ulm. If we assume a family size of five people and that each family brought just one animal in, divide 651 by five, that yields 132 animals. I bet many of them, like my great great grandpa, came with two animals. So you start playing around with the numbers and you can get up to 300 animals. We don't know that. So I'm more comfortable with the lesser number and I'll give you figures on that on the screen in a moment. So we're, we're in the ballpark there between 132, 150, 250, 300 animals probably downtown. Remember, most New Almites didn't use an animal for transportation. And, and you tell people that there's only 35 horses in New Alm and, and 900 people, that doesn't make any sense. Think of this, every time you, if you have a horse, Jim, you have a horse, anybody else have horses? Had horses, Jerry? Yeah, so I see others here. It costs you money. At least it costs you labor. You've got to water and feed them every day. You've got to clean up after them. Ideally, you're giving them a chance for a little exercise. And the fact is, living in a little 900-person town, you're probably not using your horse. It's just sitting there, and you get to do work to it every day. And so when you needed a horse, you'd go to a livery stable. By modern analogy, you'd go to a car rental place and rent a horse and a wagon to drive to see your brother in Mankato or whatever the case may be. So I'm thinking, all right, we've come to that point. Did we have any livery stables? And there's a famous writing from the New Orleans Pioneer Mag or newspaper it uh, came out in July of 1862. They're contrasting the town from its beginnings, October of 1854 to July of 1862, about an eight year span. And they're kind of showing, it's really like a Chamber of Commerce booster piece here. Look at what we have. It says there were over 200 residential dwellings in the city, among them six brick buildings. There were over 1,200 inhabitants. I'm going with the number 900. Over 20 commercial businesses, Possibly a livery stable in there, but he doesn't mention it by name. Two steam and one windmill, one oil mill, one distillery, two breweries, all right. One tannery, two brickyards, one pottery, two lime kilns, one watchmaker, two coppersmiths, three wagon manufacturers, one was a relative of mine, five blacksmiths, and two doctors. I only know of Charles Weschke as a doctor during that time, but nevertheless. So nowhere in there do they say specifically a livery stable. It could have been included in the 20 commercial businesses. But I think we did have them, and I'll tell you why I think that. Um, we know that there was stagecoach service. In newspaper stories and ads from 1860, 61, and 62, it shows we had stagecoach service from Mankato to New Ulm, St. Peter and Traverse to Sioux to New Ulm, and from Fort Ridgely to New Ulm. And if you've seen old movies, you know what a stagecoach looks like. They're generally running pretty fast, which would make sense. You're not going to have a, a stagecoach loaded up with people who are eager to get to New Ulm and just trot along leisurely. No, so they were probably driven pretty hard. I'm sure those stagecoaches were loaded with supplies and freight as well. And I can't believe they come 30 miles from St. Peter, Mankato into New Ulm, drop the stuff off, and immediately turn around and race those horses back. That doesn't make sense. That would be asking a lot of those horses. So they had had to have, in my opinion, had to have had a livery stable or two or three in New Ulm where they would change out into fresh horses. To me, that just makes sense. We had hotels. We had the Union Hotel, which becomes the Grand. We had the Dakota House and Pennsylvania House. So we had three hotels. 
Think of, a, think of a modern hotel. What a modern hotel is serving a, a visitor who's come somehow via some transportation to stay there. You've got to accommodate the transportation. Hotel, modern hotels have parking lots. There's gas stations nearby. To have a town that had stagecoach service and not, and not have any livery stable wouldn't make sense. It'd be like a town without a parking lot or a gas station. You simply wouldn't do it. So I, I would contend there were probably about 15 horses in the livery stables that were, pro if they weren't specific livery stables, they were part of the three hotels. So that was a long way to get to where I'm going, right? <laughs> we can't prove that New Almights brought their own animals downtown to be protected. It seems logical that some would have if there was room. Now I'm gonna lay some numbers on you in a little bit here and when I say if there was room, that's a factor. But I also know from, from different accounts, depredation claims among them, that New Almites left the barricades downtown to go to their individual mini farms, their homes, and take care of their animals because the, it, the, it talks about it. Uh, several families, the Baumler family being one of them, where they came out of the barricades, went to their house, roughly as I'm pointing on the corner, and I think two or three of the kids got shot at just because the Indians were just coming on the first attack. And so we know that people left. I know that my great-great-grandpa went out to his farm nine miles away to deal with his animals between the two fighting. So that tells me if they were doing that, that they didn't bring their animals downtown. Also, the farmers who left, the ref, not the, yeah, the farmers, the refugees who left, if you didn't, okay, hey, the Indians are crazy. We got to rush into New Orleans quick. You had to have opened up your barns and your pigsties and your chicken coops and the fencing. You had to let those animals go. You didn't know if you're ever coming back or if so, when you were coming back. If you left them all confined, they would have starved to death. Well, presumably, we don't know who would have come back in time. And there's talks of after the fighting was over, going back to some of the farms, and these animals are just squealing with hunger. They, had, they were confined and they couldn't get out and they were near starving to death. So we put all of those numbers together, and this is my guess at how many animals were downtown. So 35 horses, that uh, kind of goes contrary to what I said, that New Almites didn't bring their horses or the big animals downtown. Well, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Uh, relief defender officer horses, remember the guys coming from Mankato, St. Peter and such. Livery stable horses, a guess. And then the refugee animals, based on the numbers of people, I kind of did a little math. So this is all, this is a guess. But it's a ballpark guess. I mean, if, you, if I didn't do this, there would be nothing we could point to. I think we can say with some degree of accuracy that that's somewhat true. If you took away the Nuam horses and diminished a few of the others, you might have 250. So I'm saying downtown in a three block area, there was 250 to 290 animals, big animals, horses and oxen. That's a lot. Go walk, walk a block and just, or look downtown and just, holy cow, this would have been crazy. All these animals. So let's talk about animal behavior and their needs. I interviewed Jim Jensen. Many of you might know Jim as a, he had clothing businesses for many years. And if you paid attention, and often he would have little Western wear sections in his stores. <laughs> and I always wondered about that. And I come to find out Jim is a master horseman. He's had horses his whole life and, and is quite respected in the world of horses. So we did a little interview. And the first thing Jim tells me is, these are delicate, scaredy cat animals. They're big and muscular, sure, but they're skittish and nervous. Uh, they're flight animals was a term you used, Jim. That is when they're scared, their response is to flee or back away. They're, they, it just, they don't deal well with stress. Um, I, I was, when we were young, Patty, we went to Bob and Maggie Schradel's in Belle Plaine. In sixth grade, a horse kicked back, not, not like that, but kicked back at me and almost shattered my left hand. Oh, so the horses are dangerous when they're scared, and we've established that they are scaredy cat animals. Uh, lashing out like that, biting, a horse can bite you pretty hard, and uh, kicking back, they, they were dangerous. Jim pointed out the fact that if they were all clustered together with mares in heat, that would have driven a lot of the boy horses crazy. Nothing's new there, right? <laughs> but, so there was a big problem. And I don't want to be crude, but you know, when they're scared and there's fighting going on around them, between the two battles, it probably wasn't so bad, but during the fighting on the 19th and 23rd, that would have been a big problem. Uh, losing control of the bowels and the bladder, it had to be quite the mess downtown as well. Speaking of messes, <laughs> I interviewed Bill Baumgartner. Bill, Bill is a longtime veterinarian with our uh, vet office here. He deals primarily in large animals like oxen. 
And he said, despite the size of them, they're pretty mellow, easygoing animals. They, uh, they get along with other animals. It wouldn't have bothered them to be penned in downtown with other horses, other animals they didn't know. That wouldn't have been a deal to them. Uh, they're just pretty easygoing, but their size is dangerous. If you got between two of them or up against a wall and one smashed you, you could crush you to death without even giving it. They may not have even known you, they did anything wrong to you. So think of what you had to do. If you've got 200, if you're going to agree with me that there were 250 to 290 animals downtown, and they're there from, most of the refugees came after the first battle. They would have come on the 20th, most likely. So if, if they're downtown, all of those animals for about five days. They needed a lot of food and water. So a large animal, a horse will eat about a thousand, no, weighs about a thousand pounds, and an oxen about 1,500 pounds. They eat 2% of their body weight per day. That's a lot. So we would have gotten hay for them from the little mini farms in New Ulm. Remember depredation claims people told me left and right in those that they lost lot, tons of hay. So we would have, they would have collected that they would have gone to harvest hay just outside of the barricaded area downtown and bringing that down for the animal feed. Now, both Jim and Bill agreed that in the heat of August, and it was hot, many first-hand accounts say it was quite hot, although it rained every day. Nobody says that, but I read enough reports that, that will cite a specific day. On the 23rd, it rained. On the 22nd, it rained. And so it rained every day. Well, that means humidity to me. Heat and rain, that's humidity. And so these were uncomfortable animals, but they probably weren't eating as much as normal when they're stressed like that and in the heat. Water, each animal would drink between 10 and 30 gallons a day. You know what a 55 gallon drum looks like, I imagine. You know, half of that per animal per day. Plus 2,000 humans need water. We don't have any information that talks about the wells downtown, but there had to be them. That just it stands to reason. And I'm gonna contend that the younger people, teenage boys if there were some, formed a bucket brigade. You've got 250 whatever animals downtown that drink that 30 gallons a day. They had to be pumping continuously, taking it out to feed and water these guys all the time. It would have been, uh, it would have been quite dangerous. So my idea that if you had, is that going to be the right picture? If you get going, Terry. So there's a, a shot of Nuam from 1871, but just to get the scope of the distance we're talking about. I'm going to contend that they took wagons, and all of these, most of these refugees came in wagons of different types. This is the, from the Leavenworth Rescue Expedition up in the top floor of the museum. It's the only, to my knowledge, only wagon from that time that still exists, that we have in our area anyway. And so taking them, and there would have been bigger, more durable ones and lighter ones, but taking them and making mini corrals downtown. To have 250 animals that could just range from 3rd North to Center Street would have been crazy. Are you going to be a 15-year-old boy walking up to here? You come with a bucket of water and they all come after you? Super dangerous. Super dangerous. They would have smashed out windows in any building had they not been confined. So I'm going to contend, this is me using my logic. This is not a proven fact anywhere. So I'm going to contend that that's my drawing. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm, so we got... Third north here in the barricades, going south to second north and such, that they would have did possibly even making two or three mini corrals per block to contain the animals. Just think of trying to feed and water them without being some sort of confinement system like that. It would have been crazy. It would have been dangerous. It would deadly actually. So you can say, Terry, you can't prove that, and you're right, but I think there's some rationale we can apply to this. I'm going to leave that up there because I know everybody likes it. <laughs> to be honest, I actually had, uh, I, I approached three or four professional artists to do the definitive drawing of this, just like Mike Eichen has the definitive picture of what New Ulm looked like. I said, you could make your name famous in history. I can't pay you anything, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you could make your drawing be the definitive drawing. And they all looked at that and said, that, um, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Actually, Jason Jasperson said, it's far more work than you think. I'd have to get the musculature of the animal, each of the animals, right? The different positions laying down. You notice I've even got a dead one here. <laughs> eyes are X'd out. I've watched cartoons in my day. <laughs> so let's talk about, not because I want to be gross, but let's talk about reality. And the reality is the filth. 
So imagine 250 to 290 animals waste from nearly a week of confinement. Um, Baumgartner taught me a new term I never heard. He said it's very common in the veterinary world. I said, with all of that crap downtown, would they have, would have been gross to the animals and they wouldn't like it? He said, what you're talking about, Terry, is called shud. And Clay, you use some judicial discretion in this. I don't care if you use it. Uh, shud is a mixture of shit and mud. <laughs> <laughs> And he said the shud would have been piled high. It probably was a foot high already by, by just a few days. That many animals can find that close. But think how smelly that would have been. And the men are on the barricade. They're, on the, they're not far away. The guys would be on the barricade right here. So that would not have been pleasant duty. Uh, and Bill pointed out the thousands upon thousands of black flies that would have come. Smelling all that stuff, all that crap, literally, uh, would have attracted thousands upon thousands of flies who are bugging everybody, all the animals you've seen, you know, when they, uh, and the people as well. We didn't have um, metal screens. Metal screens had been invented by 1862, but very few people ever, ever were using them, not in, not in the Midwest anyway. So you either left your window open or you hung a lacy curtain in front of it or some sort of oiled cloth to keep out the bugs, but they can keep in the heat in as well. So with all of the animal crap then, and I don't want to be crude, but 2,000 people need to do the same thing. And I don't, outhouses wouldn't have contained that. And outhouses were the back of the buildings near where the barricades were. There was a sense of danger to do that. So the, the flies and rats and mice and other rodents Birds were annoying the men in the barricades and everybody for that matter. I would also contend, this is not about the animals, but I bet it could apply, that nobody got an eight hours a night of sleep during the fighting. The fear more than anything, perhaps. But the noise, the smell, the heat, the bugs, it just, nobody got eight hours of sleep. I can't believe it. So we know that some animals died, as shown by the wonderful drawing there. <laughs> um, we don't know how many. I can, I can make some guesses, but it's just, it's really a guess. So 30, maybe more, I, I don't know that. But, but we know animals died. And we know this because when the town was evacuated, most people, most New Almites or refugee people stayed away for a, oh, one to four weeks. Some stayed more, stayed away longer, I know that. And some came back after a couple days. So in round numbers, one to four weeks, they would have stayed away. Well, shortly after the Second, ba second Battle of New Orleans, Captain Jerome Dane was over by South Bend or Lake Crystal. He was a U.S. Army guy. And he came with a group of people to kind of take over New Ulm in case it was attacked again. And he talks about how you could smell New Ulm for, uh, for miles away. Think of the shud, think of the dead animals deteriorating there. Um, we don't know what happened to them nor how many, but imagine digging a grave for a horse. Well, it'll take you hours to do that. Nobody had a bobcat, they're gonna just scoop it out. You were physically digging, it. so that's probably not what happened. If there were as little as 10 dead animals, and I bet there were more, you would have most likely, uh, Baumgartner agreed with this, put them into a pile, put some accelerant on them. I don't know that gasoline was invented then, but something, kerosene, whatever, and burned them. That would have been the most likely way to do that, which had to be a horribly disgusting thing to do. I've talked to some funeral directors here. Even a human, after about three days, they basically, and I don't want to be crude to anybody, especially if you've had a recent loss, but if you've been dead for about three days, your tendons disintegrate, and they basically roll you into a tarp to move you out. Well, imagine dead oxen and horses. You could, Bill said it's very real that if after, if some of the early deaths of the horses, which were probably left just to lay in the middle of the, of the downtown, you try to pull a leg to get, get that thing moved, you pull the leg off. So a horrible, disgusting job to do, but had to be done. So this is not a pretty picture, but to represent the concept. So the aftermath of what all happened here, we don't know. So they evacuate the town. Charles Flander wants to leave. He says, we've got to get out of here. Uh, this was on the 25th of August. The last battle was the 23rd, 24 hours into the 24th. Flander says, we're leaving on the 25th to Mankato. And he, he had opposition. Jacob Nix, the leader of the first battle, among others, said, no, we can't go. We don't know what's out there. And that's not irrational. Those prairie grasses were four to six to eight feet high. They don't, they, you could have had 100 Indians hiding, and they wouldn't have known that. But Flanders says, we are out of ammunition virtually. If another attack came, we couldn't defend ourselves. We don't have enough bullets. 
Um, we're perennially out of, low on food and drink for ourselves, not to mention the animals. And we will die of dysentery with all of the filth here if we don't get out of town. And so we're leaving tomorrow, get over it. Well, I added the get over it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, they did, they took off and they made it. They made it to Mankato in 30 miles. When my father died unexpectedly 12 years ago, I always wanted to go as a boy to St. Peter with him where we had cousins. That was a part of a Boy Scout badge I could have gotten. But we never did it. And I thought to honor dad, I'm gonna to walk to St. Peter. And I called up my friend Danny Bernick who was doing marathons at the time. And I said, Dan, wanna walk with me to St. Yeah, I'll go with you, Terry. We used to work together at his bar. And so we got to Nicollet, 15 miles away. I said, get your cell phone out and call Trudy, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> now the difference is, I had had eight hours of sleep the night before, but uh, I didn't live through the fear that those people did. And I had the option to get away. I could have made it, I would have hurt myself, my feet were killing me. But uh, these people didn't have that. It's, it's get to the next town for safety or God knows what's gonna happen to us out here. So they made it, which is crazy. Um, all the animals pulling, we're, we're, we're going with about 225 animals pulled the wagons. That can be debated, but. So what happened to the animals that are now in Mankato? And then they shunted some of the refugee people up to St. Peter. And I've always said, Bryce, you could be my banner carrier for this. Tell Mankato Chamber not to, we, we, I used to work at the chamber here, was in charge of tourism, and we could promote the U.S. Dakota War. Come to New Orleans, see the site of the largest Indian battles in American history. Uh, that was an easy sell and many people came for it. Mankato shies away from that because of the negative associated with the mass hanging. I would say, Make a case that you were a refugee town to 2,000 people. That's a more noble thing to promote and why they haven't jumped on that, I'm not sure, but you tell somebody. And I expect that to be done by. <laughs> so, so did they, did they uh, yes ma'am? What was safe in Mankato? What was safe? Why, why did they go there? It's the nearest big town and it's the opposite direction from where all the fighting had been. Yeah. Support them. Yep, exactly. Yeah, they're, they're, it only made sense. So, uh, what did the what did the New Almites and the refugees do with their animals? We have no idea. Did they sell them to local Mankatonians? I suppose some some did. Some would have wanted to keep theirs and come back, but others had had it. Others had had it and left Minnesota, not just New Ulm or Southern Minnesota, left Minnesota never to come back. We don't know numbers on that, but I'm sure some who may have had a, an ox said, here, take the dang thing, we're out of here. And they left never to come back. So, sure. yes, John. Do you think some got used for emergency food supplies? Yes, exactly. And in fact, I should have said this, uh, Rudolf Leonhardt was in New Ulm at the time. He was in charge of eight feeding stations for locals. And I imagine, it's not, he didn't record it in his memoirs, but I imagine that he um, confiscated some of the ox and he would have given government vouchers for payment for that. But uh, so, yes, I believe some of the refugee towns housing is probably would have used, bought some of those animals for food. Uh, we have no report of the animals or of the birds, but in the depredation claim, some are saying as many, I lost 75 geese. Well, the Dakota were not going to herd 75 geese and take them for their use, so those birds probably flew away or wandered away. <laughs> we do know that from the top of the, what was the Erd building downtown with the telescope up there, that they could see Indians herding uh, milk cows from New Ulm upriver. So we know that some of them were stolen. I, didn't, I did not find that claim in depredation claims, but it could have been the, wrong, the ones I read didn't include those people. So. My great-great-grandpa goes back to his farm and his, all his crops are ruined. He had eight types of crops. I found that interesting. I always think everybody raised wheat back then. Uh, his barn was not destroyed, but his house was opened up and looted. All the windows were broken. But uh, some of the depredation claims talk about their barn in New Ulm, talk about their barn being burned with animals in it as well. So it had to be horrible. Well, in summary, the animals are a forgotten story from the U.S. Dakota War, but they suffered as much or more than many families did. They were lost, abandoned, burned, scattered, killed for food, wounded, or emaciated. For beings who provided so much needed horsepower and food, their story is one neglected. I hope my work helps credit the animals and give them the respect they deserve. Thank you, folks. So, anybody got questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I can't remember what you said about cows, 
But I, I, I would think there would have been no cows that would have been kept inside the compound. For food, for food for the local people. For babies, probably. Yeah, yes. And uh, uh, maybe there wasn't, usually there's a need for additional milk other than the mother. That's a good point. So there probably would have been. I bet so. They would have you know, brought some of the New Almites' own cows in. And I su suspect some of the refugees who didn't have time and had to react right now when they found trouble was coming grabbed th that steer is out grazing. I don't care. We're taking the milk cow, honey, and we're going into New Almites. So, yeah, there probably were some. You're right. And they, you talk about needs, they would have been needed to have been milked twice a day. You, Bill was talking about all the diseases, mastitis, and others that they get if they're not milked properly. So, yeah. How long did it take them to get the man I don't know a time period. They left about 10 in the morning and got there in the evening. So, what? Two days. Eight? Two days. Well, some stayed over by Judson. At the crisp farm. Yeah, the but... Yeah, but I think many went on the full first day, yeah. So the ones that got there the quickest were the ones that had horses. The ones with oxen didn't get there until the next afternoon because the oxen were so much slower. Yeah. You know, a horse at three miles an hour, you figure that out, it, you know, they got Straight, and they're not going straight. They're going to stop and right. rest them and feed them and everything. So and, and the evac. That'd be a tough day's day travel. The the fear, though, you know, these grasses are because the fear was the uh, the Winnebago Indians south of Mankato were going to join the Dakota somehow, which never happened at all. But the fear was there that they they are hiding in the grasses. We've got to keep pushing on, push on. So, actually, in in look at here. Uh, maybe it's not clear enough, but there's two ladies in the sick ladies in the back of the wagon here. I looked closely at that and noticed that for the first time. So, any yeah, Jerry. Um, at Fort Ridgely, uh, after the battle was over, the troops buried a lot of horses that had been killed. I would have thought in New Orleans, even if they burned animals, they would have buried the bones that were left somewhere. You'd have thought with all the building. Excavations done later in the that would come across I've always wondered, Darla, do you know of any stories of finding after effects as the town rebuilds? Yeah. Yeah? So I, I've never it's encountered that. Milford. Okay, up by Milford, she said. Remnants were found. I suspect that happened, Jerry. And with the tall grass, a lot of animals that were left loose certainly would not have been found by the Indians or anybody else. Right. But certainly the quartermasters and the troops that came through later found these animals and used them as part of their feed. Yeah, yeah. Part of their food. Peter Schmitz is far, and all his animals were gone, but he said he noticed herds of cows in the, in the woods surrounding his property that weren't his. And that's just animals who broke out of their confines and naturally herded together. And so, yeah, it's just there's so little. There's nobody's memoirs that came up with this. This was just, I'm not making this into some great work, but it, it was kind of fun to take this little piece of information and ooh, that little piece and put one more together and come up with a scenario, that whole idea of the mini corrals inside downtown. That's my invention. It seems reasonable to me, but I, I don't know that. So, and the numbers in a ballpark, don't take them as verbatim, but anybody else? Yeah, Mark. There is. is there anything as you read through the personal accounts that jumped out at you as a either a topic for another uh, Ooh. Class, or or did you see some things that you go oh this is fascinating yeah, the, yes the the thing that would fascinate me to do something on or anybody else who wants to first of all we have these on on uh, CD at the museum the museum sorry Dial. <laughs> the personal representation of the Brown County Historic Site. Um, is this what people owned? What they owned and didn't own? Two shirts. Now, if you're making a claim and everything, your place got burned down, you're going to name everything. And no doubt people exaggerated to get a little more money than they were entitled to. But with all that, you know, that's kind of a stands to reason. But I, would, I was fascinated by the stuff that people owned. People would talk about they lost their house and two of the rooms inside were plastered. Well, big deal. We don't think twice about that. That's normal. But to, to make a point that your, your two of your rooms are plastered meant that it was a big deal. One guy talked about having a Bible and a world atlas. 
So it was, the fact that you make mention of these things was tells. So that would have been what stood out to me. Yes, Jerry. I can't believe that New Orleans wouldn't have had more than one livery stable. Uh, most of those towns, I know Fairfax, which was established later, but by the time they had 400 refugees, they had at least four livery stables. Yeah, we had many in town over the years. It, but yeah, but I could find nothing that said specifically in August of 1862 there were, but I, it had to be that the three hotels provided livery service. It had to be. Even, even a livery service in the sense that if you came by steamboat, you'd still, the hotels had, had wagon service that would go down and pick you and your stuff up and bring you to the hotel. So at minimum, those three. Anybody else? Yeah. Nobody left without permission. Charles Flandreau and his guys, his, his lieutenants and such, would, you'd need a pass to leave. And I used my great great grandpa, went out, and he got a pass from Flandreau to go out. They didn't want people to leave. Uh, the, 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 well, for one, they didn't know, but you also wanted to keep as many militiamen slash soldiers on hand as possible. So nobody was allowed to leave. You could go out and check on your farm. A lot of people locally came in to check, tend to their animals. But I think they prepared food. They tried to sleep. I just think of sleeping. Man, as I've gotten older, I thought I'd need less sleep. I need more sleep. And having the virus, I got the virus in January. Man, I was sleeping like my cat, longer than my cats almost. <laughs> and so these poor people who did not get much sleep, I imagine, certainly not quality sleep, I bet they were, let's just have a rest. They didn't know when it was coming. They didn't know it would be three days and they'd be attacked again. Yes, sir. Uh, talked about running out of ammunition. Was there any manufacturing at all at that time? Or was it just what people had on hand? I don't believe so. I don't know that, Darla. No, Darla doesn't believe so either. So, um, they melted lead. Yeah. And they'd catch, there was the rewards for getting X many bullets. You'd get a cookie or a cracker or something that they would melt and pour into bullet molds. And the challenge, the Indians were far better armed than the white people. The Indians had virtually all the same type of rifle they'd buy from the trading post at the Lower Sioux Agency. They're, you're out of bullets here, have some of mine. That wasn't the case for the defenders. You, you have a, oh God, I know so little about guns. A 12 gauge shotgun and I've got a 14 inch bore rifle. <laughs> Is there even such a thing? I don't know. But you know what I'm saying. They all had different things and you couldn't give my bullets to you because you had a different kind of gun. It wouldn't fit. Literally wouldn't fit. So. Anybody? Yes, sir, Joel. Do you suppose there was a point where the refugees from the West were forced to abandon their animals at the edge of town because they're no, we can't take any more into town. I did, I don't know that, but I did do something to kind of, how many animals could literally fit downtown. And I used, Jim, I believe you said, 12 feet around for a horse to sleep. I think that, or, or some number. Uh, and, and so I took that times the measurement of a block and 250 laid down. And I couldn't come up with a number that more than 300 that would fit the dimensions of that. So if that's one way to measure it, I don't know. But it's, some horses will sleep standing up. Yeah. Of course, but they still need room around them and you know, some of the way down. They, they'll, they'll, they'll kind of go back and forth depending on their comfort zone. You know, right? But if there's a lot of, if they're in, you know, if they're upset and nervous from the, the smoke, the horses are such uh, they have such a uh, keen ability to like to smell smoke and to see something far off that we as humans can't see. They have incredible vision. When they, they see that as a predator coming in and they get nervous and upset and agitated, that's why they, this situation I think was really difficult for horses more than the, the oxen because the oxen are a little more docile in nature. But horses, they have a really keen sense and they, they feel a lot of nervous, nervousness at times. There's very calm horses too, but in this situation I can see there's a lot of chaos, a lot of fighting, a lot of guns, a lot of smoke. Meyer's word pandemonium. Yeah. That's a great word for this. Yeah. But, um, yeah. the Somebody talks about the. Here, here, here. 
This is from my great-great-grandpa's niece again that we started the talk out with. The confusion in Nuam was awful. Women were running about screaming and wringing their hands. Many had lost their reason. And you now we can make a joke of that, but think of the situation. Who, how many, unless you served in war, in actual war time, this is, which this was, you got nothing to compare that. None of us, most of us, have nothing like that to compare to. You're freaked out of your mind. You don't know what's happening. It, it, half, the, half of the fear comes from the unexpected, the unknown. Will we be attacked again? How come, well, what's going on here? I always say this with a little humor when I do my walking tour, and if you come tomorrow at 2 o'clock, meet in front of the museum. It was a little advertisement. Um, I always talk about why wives grabbed their husband's arm with sharp fingernails and said, but you promised me it would be much better here in Minnesota. What the, <laughs> what the heck is this about? <laughs> we don't have any record, do we, of, we've talked, you and I have talked about this, Darla, about uh, mental illness. There's some cases we can record, but, uh, and, and um, merit, uh, divorces. Yes. Yeah, but some, that would be a cool topic to deal with. Your sources would be limited, but it would be something. Yes, sir. About women on the prairie, you know, going crazy like that. They were stuck. They couldn't go anywhere. All right, all right. Where would a woman in those days take off to from their farm out in the middle of nowhere? No, there wasn't a chance. They yeah. To make it and stick it out where they were, regardless of how bad. The That's right. Was. Joel, my friend Joel Botten is uh, of Norwegian extraction, as am I on my father's side. And the Giants in the Earth series of books, they talk about the, the pioneers out on the furthest fringe of it all, going nuts from just seeing the waving grasses. You know, they're used to seeing waving ocean and, and how the, those early Norwegian settlers, were, this was so foreign to their experience that they kind of went nutty that way too. So, well, some, oh yes sir, George. No, if I did, I didn't pay attention to it. What did we talk about in in uh, that New Orleans Pioneer record? There were what did he say? Four blacksmiths? Four? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I don't know. I've never paid en enough attention to it, George. Well, also tells you that there were lots of horses around or, or animals that needed shoeing. Not all blacksmiths were horseshoers, but uh, farriers. But uh, it would have been a service they would have offered. I never thought of that. I bet those guys were crazy too. Busy with all these animals coming in. Maybe wounded. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Oops. Let me grab him, John. Yes, sir. So... No, between the two attacks is when Ridgely got it twice. Okay. Yeah. So on the 20th and 22nd, I don't know what they did on the 21st, re, re, reorganize themselves. Yeah. John. Anyway, some of those animals were probably tied, especially for ones they had a milk, you know, so they could find their cow. Uh huh. I didn't think of that. Uh, that makes sense. I think the horses were. Yeah, tied together on a, a long rope. And I'm sure you read the book, The Young Man That Was Kidnapped by the Indians. Is there is that a uni? Oh, Benedict. Benedict uni, killed in captivity. Yeah, yeah, he talked about how the Indians were herding the cattle and the sheep. Yeah. But the pigs went wherever they wanted. That's right. And they were eating a lot of pork. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes, and I've often thought, as I did this, uh, read several first-hand accounts. I can't think of the lady's name in particular. Uh, where she's, the Indians had captured a lady and she wrote her narratives afterwards. Uh, what was her name? But she talked about how funny it was to see these brave warriors wearing women's clothing because they thought the lace was attractive. And they'd tie, tie like a camisole around their neck as a, as a decoration. Uh, wearing jewelry and things that was mainly women things, but on these strong warriors it miss, didn't fit her Im image of, of her captors. But we do know that they took animals from New Ulm. Horses, or uh, rather, cows were being herded upriver. Couldn't, couldn't herd geese, couldn't herd pigs. <laughs> Does anybody ever have any experience trying to herd pigs? Two of my friends who are farmers say, well, it's impossible. <laughs> so, yeah. 
some of these animals could perhaps have been uh, killed or wounded from stray shot. For sure, for sure. Yeah, those are, when I say some animals died downtown, the, the, that's what killed most of them, I'm sure. Because when you're shooting, the Indians had these good rifles. Bob Burgess used to be the director of the museum, and he was quite the ammunition and, and gun fancier. And he said those guns could accurately shoot a new on block. Well, you're not going to shoot a new on block, and then, boop, the bullet falls down. So you get overshoot sort of things that it may not hit. The, 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 the subject you're trying to shoot may not have been hit, but you hit something else by accident. And I'm sure lots of those animals were wounded. Well, some of you probably have to get to work, although looking at the hair color in here, that may not be. <laughs> but anyway, well, thank you, folks. <laughs>